you for waiting. This feature session will be moderated by Dr. Chin Pak, the Director of the Medical Mission Center at the Yonsei Institute for Global Health. It'll be an exciting session where we hear from medical practitioners who will be delivering key ideas on providing postgraduate medical education in Africa. I'm really grateful that they're joining us to share their insights with us. Dr. Pak. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chin Pak. Uh, I'll be moderating this session with Dr. Paul Choi uh, next to me. And the title of this session is uh, Postgraduate Education in Africa is Status Quo and Challenges. But before we start the session, I would like to invite all of you to the special moment to honor the late Professor Hakim from Zimbabwe. He was a renowned cardiologist who dedicated himself to the medical education in Zimbabwe. He was going to join our session to share his enormous experience in medical education, but it was very sad that he contracted COVID-19 and deceased on January 25. Words cannot express the immense grief. Please join me in a moment of silence of respect for Professor King. May God's peace and comfort be with his family and co-workers. Uh, let me begin with my experience for this session. When I was a little kid, my mom one day was very sick. She had high fever and had a severe pain in her abdomen. So she went to the nearby hospital home and the doctor said, it's okay, it's just simple stomach upset. So the doctor sent her home back with just simple medication for the digestion. But it didn't work because it was appendicitis. So two days later, her appendix perforated and had peritonitis. So for her and for our family, it was not pleasant experience. When I went to medical school, many people told me I have to study hard to become a good doctor, to become a competent doctor. But what I realized in the medical school is this. It's not my 100% responsibility to be a good doctor. Then who shares the responsibility? My school, medical school, and the Korean government shares the responsibility to provide curriculum and infrastructure and good system. So we will not discuss how to push, how to force medical students to study hard to be a good doctor, but we will discuss how we can provide a good curriculum and good system to make a competent doctor. We will discuss the resident training in Africa today. However, this does not mean Africa is the only continent that has some issues. Every country has the same problem or issues one way or the other. We discuss what is happening in Africa right now to see and to learn how the international collaboration is being done to bear the fruit and beautiful fruit. We have, a two, uh, we have three foreigners who's working in Africa or who worked in Africa and two doctors from Uganda and Kenya. They will present their precious work from the different perspective today. So our first speaker today is Dr. Chop, Dr. Mike Chop, and he is a surgeon 
and CEO of the Christian Medical and Dental Association in the United States. He and his family served in Kenya Tanek Hospital for 20 years. Whenever I see him, he reminds me of two things. One is enthusiasm, and number two is faithfulness. So today I really excited to hear his enthusiastic and faithful uh, speech today. Uh, we welcome you, Dr. Mike Chop. Thank you, Dr. Chin Pak, and it is an enormous privilege uh, today. I'm amazed at the technology that's allowing three continents at least to join together. And I believe those on the Korean Peninsula have already experienced the sunset. And yet here I am waiting, looking into the hills from my office, awaiting the sunrise. Um, so it's an incredible experience. And I know my friends who are there on the African continent, uh, they have reached their afternoon, the midday hot sun. So what an amazing thing. I thank you, Dr. Pak, for this incredible opportunity and privilege to be a part of uh, the Institute for Global Engagement and Empowerment 2021 to speak just very briefly. Now, you, uh, it was very strategic for Dr. Pack to invite one of my former Pax residents to be a part of this panel so that he is going to get the last word. And if I speak anything that is uh, off base or untrue, he will be able to correct me later during our panel session. So thank you, Dr. Olo, for keeping me accountable today in this presentation. This is my family. Uh, we uh, fell in love with Africa because uh, this is my grown-up family uh, with my son who's 27, uh, my wife of 30 years, Pam. Uh, we went when that big guy there on the left, I don't know where he came from because I'm only 5'7 and he's six foot tall. Uh, but uh, he grew up in Africa and all of my four children consider uh, Kenya uh, their, their real home. They're now in the United States, uh, but it's uh, to visit. And so we fell in love with Africa from 1996 to 2016, uh, where we served, as Dr. Pack mentioned. Africa is a big place. And I like on the map that I have on my wall at home, uh, or every other map I've seen of the world that's a flat map, in the center of that map is always Africa, a very big place, 20% of the world's landmass and over 1 billion people predicted to be 2 billion by 2050. And you can see here, this is a slide from Lancet, uh, from the journal Lancet about the surgical, about access to surgery in the world and the deep red are the places where access is the, uh, is the most difficult. Uh, this is proportion of population without access to surgery. Uh, and while no place in the world really, it seems, is 100%, there are places across Sub-Saharan Africa that are certainly close. 93% of Sub-Saharan Africa does not have access to safe surgery and anesthesia uh, that is timely and affordable, according to Lancet. 56 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa need surgical care today. Um, and I, I just want to point out in a couple of these pictures that are going to follow in the background is our images of my very busy orthopedic clinic at Tenwick Hospital, uh, where we served. Um, I just let you know that I'm a general surgeon, a board certified general surgeon in the United States by the American Board of Surgery. But when I was in Kenya, uh, after two years, the need was so great. We had an orthopedic surgeons that I began to do on the job training and to began to do orthopedic surgery and fell in love with orthopedic surgery. It actually replaced a lot of my career in general surgery. The World Health Organization uh, recommends that there be one surgeon per every 20,000 people uh, in, a, in a country, in an area. Uh, we know that some areas of Africa have only one surgeon for every quarter of a million of people, whereas even other areas uh, in Africa, there's only one surgeon for every 2.5 million people. For example, in Burundi, there are uh, approximately, it's guessed, uh, uh, an educated guess that there are 25 surgeons in Burundi with a population of 11.5 million people. And then in Liberia, there are 5 million people and approximately, it's just hard for me to believe this, but 
there are only 12 surgeons in that uh, West African nation. Uh, and just to compare and contrast the West to Africa, it's a, a, a guess that a, a, approximately 20, for every 100 live births, there are 25 cesarean sections. And, but in Africa, on average, for every 100 live births, uh, only one C-section is performed. So you can imagine the difficulty, the difficult labor uh, that many women go through to deliver their babies across sub-Saharan Africa. An all too common story, this is in, uh, again, in an area of surgery that I uh, learned to, to do and to love, uh, is in orthopedics. And this uh, patient, Frank, a classic case, fractured femur, not able to pay in a private hospital, uh, supplies, care, uh, not adequate in a, in a local government hospital. So he's returned home to a village and visits the witch doctor uh, who may or may not splint the leg and provide some sorts of usually superficial medications. And Frank will languish in a bed at home um, until they're able to find enough money to go to a private hospital or uh, on occasion able to find uh, uh, an, an NGO, a, a mission hospital like uh, Dr. Rolo and I served in at Tenwick uh, to provide this care. So you might say, okay, maybe from Korea or from the US or the other Western developed countries, let's just send a lot of surgeons into Africa and take care of this need. And that's certainly what motivated me in the mid 60s to go to Africa was to provide care. And I'll be honest with you, the idea of a surgical residency and me becoming a surgical faculty was not on my mind in the mid 90s when I went to Kenya. However, the needs were so great, uh, it was huge. And I will tell you that my training was completely inadequate in the mid 90s. It is even worse today. US surgical training is inadequate for humanitarian developing world surgical load. And, um, I routinely would see residents coming uh, and Mark would have, uh, Dr. Olo would see residents coming from the US who would come at the same level of training, but being nowhere near what Dr. Olo could do because of training in an African context. So in this context, in 1996, and your picture there on the screen on the far left, on the bottom left corner is a surgeon, an American surgeon missionary named Dr. David Thompson. And Dr. Thompson saw that he could operate, he could do care for patients in the country of Gabon for maybe another 15 years, but then what? He would return home and what would happen to his hospital? What would happen to the Gabonese people? And so out of that experience, uh, he, challenged those of us in missions across the continent who gathered every other year, uh, actually just outside of Nairobi, he challenged us to think about training Africans in Africa. And that stirred our hearts. Dr. David Thompson left. I'm sitting uh, on the far right in the bottom corner. And between us are the first three surgical residents, one from Angola, one from Madagascar, and I believe the other is from Congo. The PAX program uh, was launched. So now it's in its 25th. This is the 25th anniversary of the program called the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons, which again came from the heart and the vision, uh, the forward thinking of an American general surgeon named Dr. David Thompson. And I want to tell you a little bit quickly about the PACS program. It's training, Afri it's training African surgeons uh, who care for Africans with deep compassion. Uh, the uh, young surgeon there, uh, the woman holding the baby, is our first PAX graduate from Tembuk Hospital. Dr. Agneta Odera, holding a baby, I believe from Nigeria, uh, who had a um, atrial septal defect. Um, and uh, I caught, this is not a pose, this is not a pose picture. I walked into our recovery room at Tembuk and found Agneta embracing her baby, this baby that she had just helped to operate on, on post-op day number one. Um, our residents loved patients, cared for them deeply. They were their own people. And they did it in a way that was more comprehensive than I could. I think we'll touch on in the panel how things are different. So they share divine love. The mission of PAX is to train and disciple African surgeons to glorify God and to provide excellent and compassionate care to those most in need. It's a five-year program very similar to what, uh, at least what I experienced 
in the late 80s and early 90s in the United States, a five-year program. It's all about being in the operating room and in, in the clinics and on the wards. It's pre and post-op care, clinical and academic study. There is some introduction to clinical research, yearly examinations put on by uh, a, an African surgical uh, college. Uh, there's spiritual and ethical training, Bible study. Those are things I never experienced in my secular surgical training program in the United States. And there is direct supervision. It is not remote. It is hands-on training in the operating room with experienced board-certified surgeons. There are multiple partners involved. And I know this conference is about global partnership. And so I left Temerk Hospital to come and help lead an organization in the United States uh, the logo is there in the upper right hand corner called the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. We are about changing hearts and healthcare. This organization, I came up through the ranks in medical school, residency and graduate, uh, graduate practice, motivated to be involved with meeting people's needs, challenged by the gospel of Christ. PAX was part of that until last year. And so PAX is now an independent organization in the United States uh, as of 2020. And uh, of course, the Christian Medical Dental Association, uh, the largest Christian healthcare association in the world with 20,000 members. We are, our members are very aware of PACS and feeds faculty into the PACS program from the US. We are very grateful to an Adventist university, Loma Linda School of Medicine, that from 1996 to the present has been providing visits and accountability by their surgical faculty to the faculty across the various programs. And then the local certifying college, the College of Surgeons of East Central and South Africa, providing annual exams and a final exam to certify the grads uh, in the region. Uh, the other partner, the local Christian Mission Hospital, mine was Tenmuk Hospital, that's also where Dr. Olo trained, where our um, motto was, we treat and Jesus heals. It was our battle cry that we served uh, in, in service to the great physician, Jesus Christ. And the final partner that I'll mention our mission sending agencies from around the world, uh, including Korea, but uh, my mission was World Gospel Mission in the US. That was who I worked for um, and my sending agency. So you see six different partnerships involved. So different approaches, just to compare and contrast the difference between a traditional African uh, academic program, degrees, diplomas are given. It's a professorial pathway uh, and it's an educational career generally. Um, it's focused on educational components. Uh, whereas in the West, especially in the US, my training was to become very competent at doing surgery. Certificated program when I was done, uh, became board certified in the American College of Surgeons, very clinical patient care focused, focused on patient care. Now, this is a very busy slide. I'm sorry for that, but just some points. This slide was put together by Professor uh, Johnny, uh, who is a very well-known professor at the University of Nairobi, uh, serving in Kenya, uh, uh, who is one of the founders and, and uh, propagators of the College of Surgeons of East, Central, and South Africa. And he compares and contrasts that a traditional approach, master apprentice, one-to-one, -one, not very efficient use of the operating room, uh, in his opinion, a hazard to patient safety, uh, quality control poor, uh, obsolete procedures just being propagated over time. Um, and then even when those programs fly in Western trainers uh, with, more, with newer procedures and approaches, it is very expensive, it's disruptive, and the professors, the faculty are not really understanding of the context of that program. So the new approach with PACS is high leverage through standardized uh, training right where the residents and patients are. Uh, the, there's a lot of OR time to focus on becoming really good at technique, become the best excellent practicing surgeons. Uh, less education of shipping people off to go do anatomy classes, to go do basic, uh, less time going to do basic science, more time taking care of patients. Um, State-of-the-art procedures are introduced uh, and local, local trainers are empowered um, faculty stay on at many of these training hospitals, the residents as they graduate stay on and continue to propagate so that faculty now in many of the hospitals are being uh, are, be, are becoming nationals in, at Tembuk Hospital. More faculty now are Kenyans than ever before. And in fact, the program director, I'll show you the, pic, 
a picture of these residents here momentarily. So across Africa now, you'll see there the nations involved, Niger, Egypt, Cameroon, Gabon, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, and Malawi. And you see the long list of hospitals, sometimes more than one hospital. Uh, this is in eight countries, but sometimes more than one hospital at a particular site. Now, what has progressed? Uh, Dr. Thompson and some of us involved in the mid-90s saw this as training super surgeons who could do everything. We did not envision that specialty care would necessarily come out of this Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. But as this Annals of Surgery article in 2004 says, in the context of surgeons working everywhere with clear limitations in the infrastructure and or non-urban areas, surgical specialization should be promoted to provide the best care to patients. And so what we've seen has been orthopedic surgery. We have seen cardiac surgery. Uh, we have seen ENT surgery, pediatric surgery, OBGYN, because it's critical that specialization happen because as incredibly brilliant of a surgeon as Dr. Olo has become, it is still difficult to be the best at everything. And, and so I think Dr. Olo will attest that the orthopedic graduates who come from Tenwick have more specialized abilities in orthopedics than he does. And yet he has been trained to do a number of procedures in orthopedics. And so it's not taken away from his training orthopedics, but there has been specialization and certainly cardiac surgery. I doubt that Dr. Olo today would want to go out and do an open heart valve replacement. And yet we're having graduates who are able to do that. So programs, uh, three programs are being proposed uh, for this year, three uh, in general surgery, one in plastics, uh, one in OBGYN, one in anesthesia in Kenya, uh, one at Tenwick where endoscopy, surgical endoscopy has been a very strong uh, aspect, one surgical endoscopy program led by one of the graduates. And the countries are Malawi, Madagascar, Burundi, and Togo. So look at this curve. This is just amazing. I will tell you that in 1998, when I sat with the founders and they told me their vision to graduate 100 African surgeons in Africa by 2020, I had to stifle a small laugh because to me, it was a big, hairy, audacious goal. I could not see how possibly this program in its infancy would be able to graduate 100 surgeons by 2020. But look at the results today. Right now, there are 105 residents, 117 graduates, including uh, our friend, Dr. Olo, who's here today, 17 different programs, including the various specialties. And look at the graph. That takes us out the prediction through uh, January of 2025, with over 200 graduates. Uh, look at those residents, the residents uh, over 150 uh, at, during that time. And you'll see the programs gradually increasing in number. So I'm going to take a deep dive for just a few minutes um, on the Tenwick program that uh, Dr. Olo and I were a part of. And I'm t entitling this portion, they must increase, we must decrease. And I think that's what's happened. You see that picture again of Dr. Odera holding that baby and Dr. Philip Blasto, another one of our Ten Tenwick graduates there uh, with me in the orthopedic operating room. Tenwick Hospital, 83-year-old Christian Mission Hospital. Look at the contrast, the upper left-hand corner with uh, nurse, Trudy Shyrock, the first nurse in 1937, holding some Kenyan babies. Uh, Dr. Sturry in the middle, uh, Dr. Ernie Sturry, a primary care physician who came in 1959. And then look at the bottom right-hand corner. This was a picture from 2014 with our all these white coats. I think Dr. Olo is numbered among those circled around that fountain. Um, a number of nationals, a number of American missionaries, uh, physicians, uh, dentists, uh, students, residents, interns across the whole gamut. So look what God did between 1937 and 2014, an incredible, amazing growth. But why, how did that growth happen, especially among the medical staff? So I'm just um, moving forward one slide there. This is I'm quickly the history, 1937. Uh, nurse tech and lab tech, 
1987 nursing school training, 1995 clinical officer and medical officer internships, in 2005 family medicine uh, training in, in Kenya, 2008 general surgery training, 2014 orthopedic surgery, 2019 cardiac surgery, and then as I mentioned OBGYN and neurosurgery uh, planned uh, this year. So you see here student rotations before 1996, Kenyan students came to Tenmuk Hospital, did rotations, came to understand the hospital, um, the, the quality of care being provided, the, the, the level of uh, compassionate care, the services, the equipment, so forth. And so students rotated and then we began an internship that led to more experience. And out of those internships came an experience where residencies uh, our graduates would come back after maybe serving in a government hospital for a couple of years and come back as our residents. And now, as I mentioned, many faculty. So that's the pyramid. Lots of students, a little fewer, but many interns, then residents and faculty, which have led to that growth of that picture that I showed you from 2014. So here it goes, the moment I've been waiting for. Uh, our Tenwick Pax surgery residents, and there I got a red circle, and in that red circle appears, uh, can we advance the slide? There you go, uh, Dr. Mark uh, Olo, among many other residents uh, that uh, were part of the Tenwick residency family. Um, and uh, I have this poster put up on my bulletin board in my office at home. And I pray every day for each one of these grads uh, that they will represent their savior, that they will represent uh, the profession well and that they will care deeply in a much better way than I ever could have done so. And Jesus said to his disciples, no student is greater than his teacher. Uh, and it's true, that is true, but often the students can go on and find other teachers. And so I will say that many of my residents are far ahead of me from Africa because they found better, uh, better and more accomplished teachers than me to train them in various specialties. This was our white coat ceremony uh, in 2016, the year that I, I left uh, Kenya a few months later. Uh, our group of white coat residents in, in general surgery, orthopedic and family medicine and faculty around on the far left uh, is Dr. Kiprono Kowech, uh, who went off for orthopedic surgery training before we began our orthopedic surgical residency under PAX and uh, an excellent, well-trained. He went to Israel for some advanced training in, in, in trauma and came back. And uh, even though he looks to me as maybe his trainer, his teacher, um, it, it switched because uh, Kiprono became far more accomplished than I ever was in orthopedic surgery. Again, they must increase. We, as the foreigner, must decrease. So this... This is one of my favorite pictures from my Tenwick years. Uh, it was taken in my last uh, two or three years. Uh, as I said, I ended up in orthopedics as part of an orthopedic team. Um, the residents rotate through. And if you wanna talk about diversity, which is an important word, very important word, I think, in the kingdom, book of Revelation, talking about people from every tribe, tongue, and nation around the throne of God, worshiping him someday. If you look at this picture, you've got a fourth year uh, PAX graduate uh, from Madagascar, a third year PAX orthopedic resident from South Sudan, a second year PAX general surgery resident who's a Kenyan, um, a first year PAX general surgery uh, resident uh, who's Kenyan, uh, a Kenyan medical student who's in their fifth year, um, and a Kenyan clinical officer intern, the woman there. So five men in the picture, uh, five women, multiple nations involved, uh, to me, this was just about the most exciting thing that I could be a part of in my uh, medical missionary career. So I'm just going to quickly another busy slide. But what are the top 10 benefits of a training focus at a mission hospital? Well, I, I put in gold some of those I think were really important. Steady growth in clinical care workforce over time. Uh, these hospitals were able to handpick and keep some of the graduates and also to send those like Dr. Olo um, and, and many others, actually. I'm going to show you a picture here of Kenya, but to send them across Kenya back to South Sudan and to other nations. 
um, which allows for a, a growth in the clinical care work workforce in Africa. Frankly, African nationals, Kenyan nationals, they, in my experience, they were usually better and more culturally sensitive to the care of their own people and what their own people culturally needed in care. Um, there's a slow but steady nationalization of many department positions that occurs because of this training, uh, graduate training. Greater accommodation of national treatment protocols and priorities. We Americans, we are some of the most individually expressive, motivated people on the planet. And I found surgeon after surgeon who wanted to do it their own way when there would be protocols that should be followed, whether from the World Health Organization or from the Kenyan Ministry of Health. And so I found that Kenyans were much more in tune with protocols that were their well thought out uh, consensus opinion. Um, and so I think that's an advantage of our graduates uh, there in Africa. And then number nine, strengthen mission and government hospital systems from well-trained graduates. This was our, uh, uh, a couple of pictures from graduation uh, on the, the left there uh, from early 2019. And on the right, a wonderful gathering. Dr. Olo is there on the back row, I, I, I think, uh, or sorry, in the middle row. Uh, this is all of our alumni who came back for the graduation in early 2019, I believe, or early 2020. Um, and all gathered together uh, from all over Kenya uh, and maybe even East Africa to celebrate graduation. And I can't tell you, there's not too many pictures in my life that bring me more joy than seeing this group of accomplished, dedicated, caring, called by God servants who are now taking care of Africans. It is a great and glorious joy of mine. So here's that picture of Kenya, graduates all over. Um, uh, two of those graduates are in Kisumu, one of which is Dr. Olo and one is Dr. Jack Okumu. Uh, two are in Nairobi. Uh, one is at Chigoria Mission Hospital, who's the chief of surgery there. Four of our graduates have gone to a mission hospital about 45 minutes from Tenwick and have actually started a new program in the PACS program. Uh, very pleased with that. Dr. Blasto, I think there is the program director. Uh, one in Eldoret, five uh, have stayed at Tenwick. And I've not even mentioned uh, the one who's returned, I believe, to South Sudan. And I may have left out a couple in this whole process. So uh, amazing, again, as I say, our students, our graduates go, go beyond and uh, accomplish things far greater. I I'm reminded of what Jesus said to his disciples. He said to his disciples, it's amazing, God in the flesh said, um, you will accomplish even far greater things than I have accomplished because I'm going back to the Father, Jesus said. Imagine the Lord Jesus saying that to the disciples, that they would do things incredible uh, beyond what he had done. And so this is a picture of Dr. Agneta Odera. I have never appeared in an article in Forbes Business Magazine in the U.S., but she has, and the title of the article, The Future of African Healthcare is Female. Dr. Agneta is uh, completing a cardiac surgery fellowship after having gone to South Africa doing a pediatric surgery fellowship uh, and is there at Timbrick Hospital. Uh, and Forbes Magazine says, this is the future of African healthcare. Now, I will say that it's not only female, it's also male. And it's also contextualized men and women uh, who have uh, just been seeking training and, co and competency and are ready to serve their own people. This is uh, the last uh, white coat ceremony that happened uh, in 2020 uh, with the current group of faculty there. Um, many of whom I continue to communicate with on a regular basis. And amazingly, on the far right, my old partner, Dr. Russ White, uh, who's an accomplished general and cardiothoracic surgery uh, surgeon, are preparing to build a 20, uh, US, 20 million U.S. dollar cardiac surgery center uh, to, a, to a go along with these cardiac surgery training program. So um, I, I do want to say... Uh, thank you. And I thought to sympathize with Dr. Chin Pak and those of you who are there on the ground that have to wear masks, that I would finish my talk uh, right here at 30 minutes by putting on a Pax mask because of the COVID-19 <laughs> outbreak. So I want to say thank you. God bless. 
Thank you, Mike. It was a wonderful lecture, an exciting lecture. We went to Tanak Hospital many times with Korean students. And one day, one of our students said, this is like heaven. So I said, oh, why, why do you think this is heaven? And he said, well, everybody smiles and laughs anytime. So when I take a picture of them, you don't have to say cheese, because they smile always. <laughs> So Tana Hospital is a really amazing and special place that something's exciting always going on. And thank you, Mike, again. And uh, we're going to uh, process the session. Uh, I know you have many questions. And we have four panelists. So each panelist will give presentation for five to 10 minutes. And then after that, uh, Dr. Mike Chop and four panelists uh, will join the panel discussion. So please hold on to that moment, then you may discuss something. Now, the first panelist is Dr. Mark Olu, that whom uh, Dr. Mike Chop presented in his presentation many times. So here is Mark Olu. He is from Kenya. He uh, finished his Pax program at Tanak, Tanak Hospital. And then we had privilege to invite him over to our severance hospital in the year of year 2019 for three months fellowship at the Department of Surgery. So welcome back, Mark Olu, and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Park. Um, thank you for this opportunity to have a little discussion. I'll introduce myself once again. Thank you, Dr. Chuck, uh, who was a great teacher, a great mentor during my time in Tenwek, and it's good to be with you again here. Uh, my name is Dr. Marco Lowe, um, trained in through parks in Tenwek in Kenya uh, for general surgery. Um, I finished uh, my residence in 2017. I was in Yonsei in 2019 for laparoscopy surgery training, which was a very great experience, and I thank God for that. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege to be here. As described, um, postgraduate education in Africa is not usually standardized from country to country. In Africa, there's Different universities have different models, uh, but the model we use during our training here is, as you had been informed previously, comes from the United States model of general surgery training. It's a five-year uh, training program. Uh, Kenya is a country in East Africa uh, with a population of about 46 million people. Uh, we did a training uh, in a place called Bomet, which is in the uh, Midwest, uh, western part of the country. Um, it's a rural setting, um, and the work that was being done, we usually say, was much better than many of the urban settings within the same country. Um, initially, our normal education program here is brought up from the British program. Uh, so most of our training the, other than the postgraduate was modeled from the medical training for the British program whereby you have undergraduates, then you have internship and medical officers before people go back to do specialization. Uh, my postgraduate training was under the umbrella of PACS, that's Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. Um, it was also combined with the uh, College of Surgeons of Eastern, Central and Southern Africa. The program is broken down into two sections, two levels. Uh, you have the membership, which was the MCS level uh, for the first two years, and then you get to the fellowship level, which is three years, uh, where you get your fellowship in whatever program you are in for the College of Surgeons of Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa. One has to complete the membership level before they get enrolled into the fellowship level. 
before introduction into the fellowship model of postgraduate, most of the training that was postgraduate in our country was mainly in the master's programs, which is modeled uh, according to the British system, which is more or less a university degree rather than a fellowship. And uh, the difference, as uh, Dr. Mike Chap uh, alluded to, is that uh, less time is spent in theater, for example, for us surgeons, uh, in the master's programs compared to what we did in Tenwick in the fellowship programs. Uh, Kenya, the main challenges that I can say facing trainees is availability of good training positions. Um, the country produces about 600 medical doctors uh, every year from undergraduate training in different uh, medical schools within the country. And there are very few available postgraduate uh, slots in the different universities as well as the different fellowship programs. Uh, the Cosexa program has grown big now in the country with more sites, uh, probably in most of the regions in the country have at least one site which has been uh, accredited by the Cosexa program. In addition, some institutions may provide some programs that don't have the basic capacity to run them in the sense that uh, some of the institutions, I think, as a big challenge is for example, you, they, are, they may be training a certain program but don't have um, the adequate all the way from uh, hospital ability and that sort of thing or hospital setting for, to have good training. And so this becomes a big challenge for us. Uh, uh, so uh, pretty significant within the general African population is... Uh, the level of infrastructure that's availed. This is in, uh, in the sense of, as Dr. Mike Chap had alluded to, uh, we don't have many fancy equipment and uh, different things that people use for different surgeries, all the way from the availability of laparoscopy within the region. Although pretty different now than, let me say, five, ten years ago, uh, it's more available, but still a big population are not able to get uh, themselves into settings where they can get this type of care. Uh, funding remains a big problem, especially funding for research and development within uh, the settings. A lot of uh, university programs as well as uh, training programs have minimum funding. Uh, there used to be more research, they say, previously than nowadays, and a big challenge to that has uh, to do with the way the systems have been set up over the years. And so as a result of that, uh, many of us who do training there, once we finish our training, we tend to look outside the country for different places where we could do fellowships that could help us come and get hands-on experience on different things and different trends that the world is going towards up to this time around. Um, and this is one of the reasons I ended up in Fiancé in 2019, so that I could have a better hand and experience in laparoscopy, despite the fact that we had laparoscopy in Tenwick and uh, in the different settings that I've been in, I've been able to at least set up one laparoscopy uh, setting in one hospital and uh, been able to work in two others that also have laparoscopy equipment available. For the impact of the Christian mission, medical mission at this time, uh, at this very moment over the last year, 2020, uh, there's been a big reduction in missionary travels, but this is mainly due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, this has really pushed down efforts from within to go out and from without, especially like in our previous hospital, Tenwick Hospital, where we had missionaries come in regularly uh, for two weeks to four weeks stays to help uh, with patient care. And that has significantly reduced, especially during this COVID uh, time. A few years prior to that, um, 
uh, as discussed in different missions. Uh, we have a uh, global mission workshops that go on in Kenya every year, and it has been encouraged uh, for missionaries work from the Africans themselves. And in this sense, we're talking about Africans uh, as we were trained in Tenwek that Africans we learn so that we may go into the settings, the rural settings in our country and impact more knowledge into others and let uh, the work of God be seen through others. Um, about the pandemic, it has affected a lot of, uh, not just mission work, but just generally all postgraduate uh, programs, not just the ones in Tenet that I was in. Um, other than that, I'd uh, like to say thank you very much uh, for allowing me to be here and uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of the sessions. Thank you once again. Thank you, Mark. It was a wonderful lecture. And now we'll move to the second panelist, uh, Dr. Jin Kyung Kang. Uh, I'm sorry, Jin Kyung Chan. And she is a pediatrician. Uh, who studied uh, medicine and clinical training at Severance Hospital. And she went to Zimbabwe about nine years ago. Now she's working at the University of Zimbabwe at, at Department of Pediatrics and Child Health as a volunteer lecturer. And she is a medical director of African Future Foundation in Zimbabwe. Let's welcome Dr. Chan. Thank you for a nice introduction. Uh, my name is Jin Kyung Chan. I am honored to be here. Since 2013, I have observed many bottlenecks like in postgraduate to medical education while working as a consultant in Harare Children's Hospital. I'm going to remark three components uh, which are required to sustain uh, PGME and how to raise a big pizza of these three components. The modern society, medical society requires a multidisciplinary approach for treating difficult diseases. For this to be acquired, we need human resources, including not only excellent doctors, uh, but also experienced nurses, therapists, counselors, and coordinators, as well as high technique di diagnostic tools and sophisticated medications. However, currently in Africa, there is a lack of this kind of support. This leads to an imbalance between the patient pool in the public hospital and the corresponding response of the healthcare systems. For instance, Public hospital doctors receive poor income, and the hospital has insufficient funds to maintain a full patient pool. This eventually leads to a decrease in the number of medical cases, which would have been the basis for education and research for the currently active physicians and other healthcare providers. To resolve this problem, a systematic financial assistance to generate surplus would be required, namely surplus management. This surplus management is very important. In this system, alpha is the capital generated from a successful practice, which could be converted to investment in research and education. This kind of virtuous cycle is absolutely required in Africa, while merely scattered and sporadic assistance, as it is only available currently, is ineffective. A systematic program, along with the wholesome financial assistance, is required for building up this virtuous cycle. So three components which are to be solved for successful PGME are these human resources, and the materials and the proper income. The character of our medical industry is labor intensive and capital intensive. Therefore, different parts of the PGME team are to be developed simultaneously, including the medical staff and the administrators. While the latter group is easily overlooked, but their contribution is equally essential for successful PGME. Mm. In 
developing PGME, cultural respect on the initiator's part and the cooperation of the public and the private hospital is crucial. Uh, concerning cultural respect, one should consider what each country's values are. In Africa, capitalism and individualism are not as respected. In contrast, a hierarchical society imbuing a culture of respect and community is valued and must be adhered to. In the practical sense, when starting a new project, it is highly recommended for the initiator to first visit the elders of the related department and receive their acceptance, which many NGOs currently working in Africa have not taken heed of and thus failed to enter the center of change. Therefore, in developing the PGME system, the directors must take into consideration the culture of the individual communities and the leaders within the government. Furthermore, encouraging the local leaders' active participation in the forefront will be crucial in future outcomes. Another consideration is the cooperation between the public and the private health system, which puts a big part for the government to play. In the global history of medical systems, improvement in medical training was mostly led by the private sector, like Tanak Hospital, and followed by the public. For instance, we, if we look back to the history of the development of the Korean medical system, private hospitals like Severance Hospital uh, induced the change of a public hospital like Seoul National University Hospital. Severance Hospital, a privately owned organization, played to part as the powerful economic private system and sustained the high-cost medical welfare systems for the public. In the case of Africa, most private hospitals are too expensive for ordinary middle-class people, and therefore the patients are concentrated in the public hospital. Furthermore, the African governors overlook the role of the private sector. The government can benefit from working with the private systems as they can reduce a tremendous amount of medical budget, as we have observed in the case of the Korean medical system. In the long run, the public and private sector must work together, but in the initiating process, the uh, cultural aspect of considering the elders of the public sector must be incorporated. Now, the, please see this slide. If we only invest and concentrate on training program for specialists itself, it is the same as making a small, well-conditioned environment like the image on the left. It would not sustain for long nor be synchronized with the other parts. The picture on the right is a mangrove forest. In mangroves, thousands of shrubs grow by tangling their roots together and standing against the fierce ties. We need the harmonized and organized system in Africa. In fact, the traditional culture of Africa is based on the value of a relationship, which makes a cooperative system more effective for us. For successful uh, PGME in Africa, uh, we need to make a good and broad relationships with the gov uh, governors and the administrators in the public hospitals, providing a good example for the virtual cycle of surplus hospitals. Current cases uh, for this shown in Malawi and Ethiopia, where Dr. Choi and Dr. Kim became governors in the Ministry of Health in order to build a stronger relationship with the co-governors and build a positive health system quickly. They are members of Africa Future Foundation, like me. As such, a wholesome approach of building strong relationship, though it may take time, should be the first step. Thank you for listening. Thank you, ching -kyung. It was a very good lecture. And now let's move to the third panelist. Uh, Dr. Betty from Uganda. She is a pathologist uh, who just finished pathology program. And now she is in the Severance Hospital for one year uh, fellowship program. 
at the Department of Pathology. And she's working very hard at the department. And now she's going to speak. Dr. Betty. Thank you so much, Dr. Park, for this opportunity. As doctor has said, my name is Dr. Betty Abo Casimo. A medical officer special grade from Makere University. I just completed my residency program before I enrolled to Yonsei for bone and soft tissue pathology fellowship. I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to participate in the global partnership and higher education. I'm going to briefly talk about the status quo and challenges of postgraduate training in Africa. Briefly, as we talk of the status quo, the state of the medical of medical education in sub-Saharan Africa has been lagging behind and the situation really represents a decline in the standard just as the previous speakers have stated. As African institutions are operating at the level that are comparable to what was in the Western world in the past. African countries have, been, have not been in position to, to keep to the technological advances, and this still keeps the region to extremely lag and lack the required number of the qualified professionals. But collaborations among the medical schools within Africa, or particularly I'll talk about Uganda, have not been done. So this was seen as a challenge in the face of differing organizational cultural context. And up to date as we talk, Ugandan universities do not have exchange programs. There are about four universities offering a residency program in Uganda and only two of these have been satisfied to offer a pathology residency training. And this, out of these two universities, we have they are mainly the government universities that are offering the residency training. So when we look at the challenges that normally postgraduate medical education are facing, there is the most common is lack of adequate funding of basic and social services due to political mismanagement. And because of this, normally lead to a brain drain. So you find most of the experts who qualify actually move out of the country in search of a better green pasture to improve on their standard of living. So in this, we normally find that there's always a shortage in the number of the supervisors that would actually mentor the residents' trainees. And the other problem that has also contributed is that the stringent regulatory environment regarding training of medical workers. Sometimes within the country, there are moments when the internet has been shut down completely and it becomes hard for as a medical practitioner, you may need to consult and it becomes hard for you to, to do that. We have the few experts who are very hardworking, but due to the lack of the modern diagnostic equipment, we are still also lagging behind in terms of training. We have a national referral hospital, but if we look at the basics, I'm talking in terms of pathology. We do not have immunohistochemistry, we only do the basic H&E, that is the hematoxylin and eosin staining. 
it is the basic that we can do. So this really affects the services that are being offered. These challenges call for innovative approaches in medical education. And I believe that collaborative approaches such as consortia formation by stakeholders, if made, will actually improve the efficiency and what? And effectiveness in terms of training. And the impact of this postgraduate training, normally you find that within the training, gaps will be identified during the training. And when once we identify these gaps, it will enable the stakeholders, the partners, the medical mission to promote a strong collaborative and provide a mutual support and as well as sharing of resources for medical education to improve the quality of postgraduate training. COVID-19 pandemic has also affected the, train, the postgraduate training I can talk about it generally in Africa, worldwide, and Uganda in particular. Trainees have lacked protective gears during the training. There have been suspension of clinical clerkship and observation. The number of their elective cases have been reduced. And most of them are actually anxious, they are scared, they are stressed. Due, this is actually affecting their mental state. And there, within this pandemic, they introduced online learning, which has been interrupted by the poor network system in the country. So it has greatly affected the postgraduate learning. Thank you. Thank you, Pedi. Uh, good lecture. And now we move to the fourth and last panelist. And you will see how we organized among the panelists. We had two clinicians, Mark Olu, a surgeon, and Jin Kyung, a pediatrician, as a clinicians, and Betty, pathologist, a basic scientist. And now another basic scientist, a pharmacologist, a Professor Dong Won Kang. He is a pharmacologist from Yonsei University. And, but most important thing is he is the husband to Dr. Chan Jin Kyung, who is a pediatrician. And he is working at the Department of Pharmacology at University of Zimbabwe. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Kang. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for allowing this opportunity. Uh, I'm very honored. Uh, as uh, introduced, I work at the Department of Clinical Pharmacology, College of Health Sciences, University of Zimbabwe. And I usually teach uh, pharmacology to medical and dental students and pharmacy students as well. Uh, in addition, I also teach the same subjects uh, to the students on the master's and doctoral courses, as well as giving comments and advices to the students who are on the research track to finalize, finalize their master or doctoral courses. Uh, let me briefly talk about the research situation in Africa, especially from my short experience in the country I work for. In my opinion, I believe Scientific and medical research is one of the main ways of obtaining up-to-date information on medical knowledge for health workers. Health workers learn to know how the medical knowledge is systematically accepted by performing research processes. For this reason, experiencing research in medical area is so important in African countries as well. As a pharmacology researcher working in the Department of Clinical Pharmacology, if I narrow down to the areas only, I have had opportunities to see many doctors and pharmacists trying to undergo medical researches. For them, research topic itself 
was not a big problem uh, to work out. It is partly because natural herbal resources traditionally known to have medical effects, medicinal effects, that need studies for research are still plenty in Africa. However, not a few tries to perform research were seen to be delayed or not progressed further, even with a good research plan and schemes. And it was found that the cause of the problem had been often, often related to poor funding resources. Usually, many of the researchers who are on the postgraduate academic courses have to find their research funds by themselves, even though some of them were able to recruit their funds uh, from the local pharmaceutical companies. As for the uh, major research funds uh, currently available in Zimbabwe, uh, they seem to come from fun funds supported by WHO or uh, some funding institutions from South Africa. Uh, as well um, as some of the local pharmaceutical companies. However, they are not yet enough and seem to be, be, be still limited. Uh, so if we consider the importance of scientific research in medical and scientific areas, I guess more systemic uh, funding resources have to be developed in Africa to meet the research demands in this area. While we are seeing the ample number of topics and items available uh, for further researches. To resolve the current situation, I think, establishment of more efficient networking bodies responsible for facilitation of connecting the available funding resources to the appropriate researchers is desirable. At the same time, for the incessant efforts to recruit more research funds from various sources, like uh, from those outside of the country, uh, seem to be also required. Uh, these are my brief impression about the research situation in this area. The postgraduate students trying to research works have been confronted. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Kang. Uh, we had a good chance to know the situation for the research at University of Zimbabwe. Now, uh, we will have a panel discussion. So we don't have any pre-set up script. So it's open to any question from anybody to anybody. <laughs> so be ready. So. Any questions so far uh, to anyone? Let me start first. So I like the older uh, presenters' uh, speeches and lectures. I seems uh, in the mid east of the Africa and then Tenac Hospital. I have been there several times. I enjoyed uh, with the colleagues in uh, Africa. So um, that. I saw that uh, Mike Chop uh, said the mission of uh, Parks, Pan Asia a Academy of Christian Surgeon, to train and disciple African surgeons to glorify God, to provide excellent and compensate care. So, um, and then the motto of Tenue Hospital is to tre retreat Jesus heals. Can you elaborate on the meaning of this saying and how do you uh, incorporate this motto into the PACS program? So that's a really good question, Dr. Paul. I, um, it, it's, it's not a model that we hide. It's, we have a very large water tower at the entrance which has the same motto painted, We Treat Jesus Heals. I think a big emphasis of the hospital is on a chaplaincy uh, department and spiritual care. Uh, there are approximately 10 chaplains who do work on all of the hospital wards and even outpatient with uh, spiritual care with patients. And they come alongside um, 
on many occasions, I will ask for a chaplain to consult for a patient, uh, maybe with uh, alcoholism and because they were drunk, uh, were hit by a vehicle on the road at night and had a fracture. Um, so we work in very good collaboration with the chaplaincy department. Uh, we pray with patients in, in rounds with the residents and the interns and the students. Sometimes we would stop and, and thank God and praise God for a good outcome. Or a patient who was very sick in the ICU, we would stop and pray for that patient's recovery and acknowledge with the patient and the family that we were depending heavily, especially a patient who had multi-organ system failure, uh, ventilator dependent, very difficult situation. We had done everything that we could do, a very competent team, we had extended our resources. We asked God to intervene and ask Jesus to heal. So I think the residents saw that in, in, in action on, in every day. And we certainly we talked about such things in our regular uh, Bible studies and meetings uh, with residents. Um, I believe that the residents saw that put into action on a daily basis. And as, as a faculty member, I, I, thank, I tried to do my best to thank residents when I saw them take leadership, especially as a fourth or fifth year resident, into demonstrating to the other residents how prayer is important in a patient's whole, whole care. So we treat, we do everything we can with the best we can, and we leave often results to God to change hearts because it, it, in the end, it, it determines health outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I just continue to ask uh, Mark Orlo. You are uh, is a graduate of a Parks program. Uh, was it uh, very competitive to uh, become a Parks uh, surgery resident? Why did you choose this program? So please unmute. Thank you very much once again, uh, Mr. Shoei, for that. Um, yeah, PACS program, it was a, to me, I will honestly say it was a very good idea. Uh, the training that was done there is a different step from what had been occurring in our country. As I told you earlier, the system had been different. It had been totally university-based uh, master's programs which is a very different setting from the fellowships and the residency-based, hospital-based programs. Uh, the greatest thing that you come to learn once you leave the PACS program and learn to appreciate is uh, it was a program that was brought up fundamentally in the Christian basis. Uh, we did a lot of things that were uh, leading towards um, bringing, the, taking care of the patient in a wholesome way. When we leave the institution and we come out, you notice that uh, the outside is more of a secular world totally. And uh, patients are taken care of just as part of a career or just as part of just getting the job done every day. And I, would, I honestly don't have any regrets going there. Um, the training was very good and we uh, left there uh, very well. As far as how competitive it is, when we were going in, it was fairly new in Tenwek. Uh, I think we were the fifth, fourth, fifth group to go in uh, to as residents. So we didn't have so many people coming in for the interviews because it hadn't been hard. Now, quickly turn about three, four years later, and uh, the applications are uh, for approximately four spaces, two orthopedic, two general surgery spaces in the institution. Uh, they get over 30, 40, 50 uh, applications, which was not the case in our point. So it wasn't so difficult then, but right now, because of the work that has been done by the residents out and the knowledge of the program, that has changed. So I know right now it's pretty competitive uh, for the younger 
uh, medical uh, doctors, medical officers who would like to join. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I may have question both to Betty and Mark. That Betty, you uh, trained at McGregor University. Yes. And I know it's very high prestigious university. It's yes. one of the best universities in Africa. Yes. And Mark, you trained at Parks program, which is very, uh, one of the best programs for residents. And now talking about uh, brain drain. So I know it's very severe or problem in every country. So both you are from a wonderful program and well qualified. And I know your heart to serve your hometown and your country in Kenya and Uganda. So I really honor and respect. And my question is, if somebody in some hospital in the United States offer you guys a job in the States, would you move? <laughs> Mark, you first. <laughs> Um, yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, a little bit of work. Uh, I mean, my experience, uh, and this is interesting that you bring that up. My experience in Yonsei uh, brought out a little different perspective of things. Um, there's a feeling that uh, there's a lot more to know and a lot more to learn that's out there compared to what we have within. Uh, the African culture, it's interesting. We probably don't do a lot of travels from this side. So there's also a big uh, effort within our culture and our family to stay home and uh, help the other people in this, uh, in our continent, in our countries, in our home areas, there's a tendency to do that. But I will honestly tell you that a big part of the medical community uh, are moving out of the country. We had a big problem, I would call it a problem at this point, when the national government uh, sent the health sector to the governors in the county governments. So the county governments, the way they manage the human resource, the medical practitioners, has really made it very difficult for people to achieve what they wanted to achieve. And that's why many people, are, especially to the US and to Australia, there's a very big migration. But other than that, I think the main thing is for myself would be, I feel like because of poor infrastructure in our settings, um, when you have a chance like to travel to severance, like you did, you, it opens your mind to believe that you could do a lot more. Now, do they need me in the US? I don't think so. Um, I think I'm probably needed more here from my training and that uh, the people in Africa, in Kenya itself even, need me more, I'm sure. There are enough doctors on the other side. Uh, sorry, Dr. Chap, in the US <laughs> than here. So I think they are welcome. <laughs> yeah, but for us, we are still have a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. So I, apart from that, I think I'll probably stay and help out because I still think there's a lot that can do on this other side. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Mark. Thank you so much, Dr. Park. Yeah, I'm going to give you two perspectives, two answers as in, in my two perspectives. Let me talk about it firstly from the Christian point of view. My coming to Yonsei Severance, I would say it has been by the grace of God for me to be here because I never expected, that was in 2020, it was never in my plan that I would have finished my year in, in, 
South Korea. I never planned, I never thought about it. But when I prayed to God, I got this opportunity to come here. And what I believe in is that there are very many destinies that are attached to me. With this training, when I go back, I need to change because a lot has changed. My mindset has changed. We need to do a lot of things to change the way we perceive things, the way we practice in my own, own country. But the other aspect where you would ask me, if you were given a job in the U.S., Betty, would you move? I would say yes, that is the other aspect. The first reason I would give you is that I would really love to, to work in an ideal setting. And when I look at that way back home, we do not have that. Like in our Ugandan system, when we look at the, the pathology labs, we actually have it only at the central level. The regional hospitals, we do not have pathology labs. So when I am done with my training here, most likely I may be sent to a regional referral where there is no lab. So what am I going to do there? So you find that I may remain at the teaching institution, but I may not practice the histo pathology. The second bit of what I would reason why would doctors normally move is the reason is is because of the salary. They want to live a better life. And in Uganda they would say that for you to earn a bet to, to earn a better or live a moderately better you need to have two to three jobs. So you're moving here and there trying to survive. But one would want to say, I think I need to go and just have one work in one setting and concentrate and really deliver my services, give it to the best of my ability. That is the reason as to why most people would actually want to move and travel out of their countries. Thank you. Thanks, Paddy. Any other question? Or comment? Uh, on the matter, mm -hmm. uh, that is the reason why we are also operating mm -hmm. any supporting program for the local doctors in Zimbabwe who are working in the rural area. So Dr. Chun is supporting in, in funds from my, my local, our local church in Korea. Mm -hmm. to support the, those doctors working in the local area. Uh, may, that, that Dr. Chen may comment. It's just a small start. So um, there are a huge area to support, but uh, I wanted to just uh, support the enthusiasm of junior doctors who wanted to devote their lives in rural areas. So it's just uh, the encouraging them. So yeah, it's just a small start, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. From what uh, I understand, the parks program provides the salary for the res uh, resident, is right? So, uh, how did you, uh, Mike Cho, how did you uh, come to the decision and how this fu is funded? The, the decision to move from the U.S. to Kenya, is that the question? No, the salary for the resident. Oh, the salary for the residents. I'm sorry. Um, so the, the, the salaries, uh, you know, there are fairly standard salaries that exist in the, in the government uh, medical system for, for doctors at various levels, postgraduate. Uh, certainly that was used uh, as, a, as a standard to compare to. And um, certainly the the salaries needed to be commensurate with the level of experience and post medical school training where they, um, where they were in their uh, post medical school. Uh, we did not want to have residents making less than our intern, our government sponsored interns who were in the same hospital and yet probably working more hours as a resident than the interns. So there were a number of factors that, that came to play and certainly 
the nuance, if I can use that word, of some African nations having socioeconomics not yet at the level, say, of Kenya. Um, it, there was a differential in salary between our Tenwick and the Kajabi other program uh, residents and, say, residents in Gabon. Um, so it, it was nation, region specific, uh, sometimes even region specific within the country of Kenya. Um, it, we wanted it to be fair, we wanted it to be even uh, on the levels of residency and graduate salary, graduated salary up as the residents progressed through the residency. And that was supported in part half by the PACS organization, half of the salary, and the other half came from those of us um, raising the funds within our mission organization, World Gospel Mission, to combine together to help Tenwick pay these residents. I have a question about uh, integration of research program in the resident training program in PACS. Because I know the training of a resident, clinical skills are important, but also the research ability or research capacity training is also very important to develop their scientific uh, thinking or way of uh, doing. So how do you train your residents in the parks uh, regarding the research capacity? So let me give a brief answer and then I want to hand it to Dr. Olo to talk about his specific experience in research at Tenwick in a residency. But I will say Tenwick was probably the most advanced of all of the PACS programs in terms of research because my partner and our chief of surgery, Dr. Russ White, is one of the foremost researchers in the world, literally in the world, on the on the problem of esophageal cancer. Um, even the National Institutes of Health in the U.S., Mayo Clinic, are very interested in what's happening at Tenwick uh, because of the incidence, very high incidence of esophageal cancer. So, with that foundation in the mid '90s of research beginning. Along comes the PACS program in a place where Dr. White and others, and then some of the early endoscopy residents began to participate in research. So we actually in 2014, 15 formed a department of research. And uh, I appointed uh, one of the PACS faculty, Dr. Bob Parker, to become the director of research at the hospital. Um, I, was, I was the chair at that time of the Institutional Research and Ethics Committee so all the research projects from an institutional perspective had to be screened by the CEO of the hospital, by myself, by the nursing director, chaplain, and uh, by our legal officer. Um, but the PACS residents were all encouraged, and I don't know how many research projects Dr. Lowe will have to tell you that he was asked to perform, but they also have competition uh, on a continental level in the PACS program, and they will enter a competition and be awarded for research projects. So Dr. Lowe, I've talked too much why don't you talk about your experience in research? All right, thank you, Dr. Chuck. Yeah, um, research in our facility, PACS, the PACS program is a very much encouraged. Um, uh, I think by the time I had left uh, Tenwick, I had published about seven papers, which is, uh, and it wasn't, as a necessity as such, an official necessity, because the COSEXA program doesn't necessarily follow that up. But in the PACS program, even right now, there's a requirement of uh, at least a minimum of a published in a well-rated uh, 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 journal of uh, a paper uh, before you do your MCS examination and another one before you do your final FCS. Uh, but generally in our setting, there's a lot of research that was ongoing, and not just in endoscopy and esophageal cancer, but in different uh, fields. We did a lot of research in uh, intestinal obstruction and just general uh, general surgery stuff. We did some in collaboration with Brown University on residents and how comparing the residents from their country to our country. And uh, by the time we were done, I think we were done pretty much. And it still continues. I have, I, I actually, right now, which is about three years after I left, I'm still 
uh, involved in some research in Chenwek together with other residents, which is interesting. I had a paper uh, that's just been published uh, this February 2021, but it came out the, uh, what do you call it, the soft copy on the internet was out by October 2020, which was a research done in Chenwek. Uh, so it's very encouraged in the facts program and when, yes, and you, I, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. And I thought one and a half hours are long uh, time window <laughs> to discuss everything, but I just found that we are running out of time and by the watch in front of me, we only have 24 seconds. <laughs> and I'm really uh, exciting to see uh, many international collaborations uh, being done in many different shapes in many different countries. And we hope uh, there will be uh, more collaboration in the future so we can talk more uh, about research and resident training. And thank you very much uh, for tonight, uh, or this morning and afternoon to join us. Dr. Chot, uh, Mark Ollu, Dr. Kang, and Jin Gyeong, and Betty, and Dr. Paul Choi. So hope oh, we can keep in touch to promote more collaboration. Thank you. Thank you for the panelists from the last session. Listening to the messages from, the, from them reminded me of my time at hospitals in Malawi and Ethiopia. And it's reassuring to know that global partnerships are in place to improve health systems in Sub-Saharan African context as well. Thank you for sticking with us on day one of the Global Engagement and Empowerment Forum held virtually via Yonsei University. Our hope is that the legacy of these times will not be of grief and sorrow, but that these times will be a testament of human resilience and celebration of life spent to better the lives of others. See you in a few hours in day two, prepared with exciting guests. Thank you.